Malcolm Klimovich has been a passionate animal rights activist and organizing member of the Kingston, Ontario Animal Liberation Alliance, Koala. With Koala, Malcolm has focused on cruelty to animals at aquariums, particularly marine land, and has demonstrated outside fur auction houses. After being inspired, inspired by an animal rights documentary called Inside Fur, Malcolm went undercover and filmed five fur farms. And subsequently, Malcolm currently faces up to 10 years in prison for exposing the cruelty that lies behind this industry. Thank you for taking the time today, Malcolm. Oh, no problem. Glad to be here. Oh, me too. Yeah. So I'm always interested to start with uh, finding out how people found the vegan path. Everybody has a different story. Um, <clears throat> well, my, my path is quite long, which took many, many years. Uh, I originally started off as a vegetarian. Um, when I was about 23, I changed over. Um, <clears throat> my mother had been a vegetarian for quite a long time already. Um, she grew up on a, a pig farm, so she would actually have to help do things with the pigs with her father, like, you know, castrate them, they would get mutilated, dock, docking their tails or whatever, and giving them painful injections. And she used to tell me these stories quite often, so kind of sunk in my head. Uh, most of my girlfriends uh, I've ever had have been either vegetarian or vegan, so over time, um, you know, it influenced me to uh, go that route. And then I met somebody that was a vegan that I was uh, pretty close with and um, they told me about all this stuff about factory farming and um, you know the horrors inside slaughterhouses and this kind of stuff and I never really knew about it it was it was kind of before you know Facebook or like the internet it was like really available with all this information I started reading books like uh, um, eating animals that was very influential for me um, uh, the book about McDonald's, about how the meat's um, processed there. I think it's called Fast Food Nation or something like that. They talked about the, you know, the, the ill treatment of the animals. And um, another thing too, somebody handed me a flyer one time. I was walking around. It was like a PETA or Mercy for Animals. And, um, I think that that was kind of what started it for me. And then um, I was involved with doing other types of activism, like anti-poverty work. Um, protesting, you know, pipelines, this kind of stuff. And I was surrounded by activists, but nobody was really talking about animal rights activism. Um, then I started getting involved in, you know, things like protesting the circus, protesting against uh, whale captivity at Marine Land. And then uh, I organized uh, the group Koala, which is in Kitchener, by the way, not Kingston. Oh, sorry. This misprint. But um, yeah, we started organizing all sorts of different events and just taking it from there. Um, yeah. Yeah, I got that off of a website for the, I think the new film that's coming out, right? What's it called? R Real Fur? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's where I got that. So they... I'll, I'll give them a phone call. Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah, sorry to keep track. It's, uh, I've moved around. I'm in Montreal now, so... Uh... Are you? Okay. Okay, so then eventually you ended up in a courtroom which uh you know i'm sure you didn't actually plan on but unfortunately it seems like more and more animal activists are ending up there and especially in ontario so they've they've introduced ag gag legislation now in ontario to make it even more difficult to be an animal activist um you know but, but you started doing this way back it sounds like a, several years ago and so what, what, what was the first time you walked onto a fur farm? What, what was that about? What, what was that like? Um, this actually, well, actually happened like way before the end fur farming campaign or my investigation or anything. I, I, uh, I went to a fur farm with uh, one of my friends, a mink farm uh, close by Kitchener where I used to live. And uh, you know, I saw the perfect treatment, you know, the captivity these animals are forced to live in. And um, after we started the koala group, um, we started actually going to this farm and uh, protesting it all the time. Actually, that was the first time I got arrested was at a protest at a fur farm. Uh, me and another activist ran onto the property towards the mink sheds across uh, this farmer's huge lawn. <laughs> we were actually chased by three cop cars. Uh, I had a gorilla mask on because it was kind of a theatrical protest. I'm sure your, your viewers can imagine the scene of me running, uh, please chasing me, this kind of stuff. But um, uh, fast forward, you know, several years later, uh, I was taking animal rights um, much more seriously. Um, I had seen that um, documentary film Inside Fur out of Norway. I've seen the successes of uh, that film, of them showing the, uh, you know, the, the footage of the, the horrifying conditions of the you know, fox farms, mink farms to the public. 
And um, that inspired me to start my own investigation. So um, I wanted to go to, you know, several mink farms uh, all over Ontario and document, uh, you know, whatever I found there. You know, we have, I've heard stories from other activists. I've seen videos uh, on YouTube of uh, footage inside this, these farms. And uh, I wanted to make it more accessible to the public. Uh, and, you know, these videos that were available were done anonymously for the most part. So there was a question, you know, if they were real or, you know, tampered with or valid or whatever. So I wanted to act as a witness so that I would record it and also, you know, act as a witness in court or to the media or wherever, um, you know, so that it could be verifiable and uh, not just some random video on the internet, but put a face behind it too and I could act as an advocate. Um, the first farm I went to was um, in Oshawa. Um, I actually heard about it from uh, an activist um, who had stayed at a bed and breakfast on the property. And he had, uh, the, the, the bed and breakfast was separated by a little forest and then across was a mink farm right behind it, but he could smell this weird smell. And he went there and took a couple of photos and uh, you know, he told me it smelled like dead animals rotting there. So that was the first farm I investigated. And uh, you know, that led to me investigating uh, four other fur farms before I stopped. <clears throat> submitted the, uh, the footage to the police, basically. So that's the thing. I mean, it sounds, I, I don't think until COVID people even realized that there's so many of these fur farms across Canada and BC here as well and, and Ontario. And now we know that COVID can be transmitted from humans to the animals. And then, and then it sounds like what, the, what happens is it, it remixes itself and then it, it jumps back to humans and that's where the variants have come from right yeah yeah and, um, Denmark most notably they had the call of like you know the entire mink industry there was destroyed they killed all the animals by order of the government so they don't want the mutations uh you know going to the public these mutations are vaccine resistant from what I hear and uh, you can imagine how detrimental that would be to public health if uh, you know these mutations are going around um, you know, this is the <clears throat> case of all zoonotic diseases. You know, you got the avian uh, flu virus, you got the mad cow disease, you got the swine flu. Um, you know, the list goes on. These these diseases aren't new. They all come from factory farms. Uh, you know, the mink farm is just uh, you know hitting in the media right now uh, with these uh, mutations. But this is a, a trend in factory farming across all animal industries, not just uh, mink farming. Right, and and so. So when, like, how would we know if we're driving by a mink farm? I mean, what, they're all inside, I'm guessing. They have no access to the outside. And how, how did, do you sneak inside to get these photos? Or can you speak about that? I guess your trial's over. Um, well, most of them are hidden. They're not really publicly advertised where they are. You can't just go to one usually. But um, yeah, they're just really, typically, manks are kept in like these really long sheds. Um, they're actually open to the outdoors so they can, uh, view the outside, but they never really get sunlight on them or anything like that. Um, the reason for that is they're exposed to weather um, in the winter time or the fall when it's cold so that it um, actually forces their pelts or their fur to, uh, you know, become more, more thick or whatever so they can sell their better selling point or whatever. But um, yeah, nobody could just go to these farms. This is one of the reasons why I did these investigations. Um, you know, it's typically hidden from the public. And then you got the fur industry in Ontario and globally, you know, pushing out these, um, you know, myths about fur. Um, I know in Canada, they, they have, um, through the North American Fur Auction, they have a website called Truth About Fur, also hashtag, and they would pump out, you know, misinformation about how humane um, the fur is, about how humane the animals are treated, about how environmentally friendly it is. But, you know, if you dig, you know, a little deeper, just do a quick Google search, you can see, you know, the, the horrifying experience the animals go through. So, you know, showing these videos to the public and the fact that, you know, this is not like fur farms in China or like some random place. These are happening, you know, 20 minutes away from people in some cases, you know, these farms aren't that far away from cities. But, uh, they are kind of hidden. And then do they do all the, pro like the killing and the, and the skinning and all of that, do they do that in the same place or do they ship, are these animals shipped like uh, farm animals are? Um, I'm not that knowledgeable about it. From my understanding is that um, they would be killed on the farm for sure. Um, I don't think most places ship them to be skinned, but that may be the case in some farms. Some of these places are, you know, 
huge, huge facilities, you know, they're processing, you know, like 20, 30,000 animals per year or so. Um, a lot of them are equipped, um, you know, to do that. Huh. Yeah, you wonder, like, who are the people working in these places? It would be interesting if they would step forward, wouldn't it? And, um, uh, yeah, I was speaking with uh, Leslie Fox recently of, from the fur bearers, and, you know, she was pointing out just the, the, the impact on the environment. I mean, it, where do all the bodies go? You know, it's not like we use the bodies for anything. It's just the skin, right? So, um, well, the, the case that I'm involved in right now with uh, fur farmer Walt Freeman, he actually has a raw dog feed uh, processing facility attached to the farm. So, I don't think it says anywhere that he's using, uh, you know, mink meat, but uh, one can only speculate where this, uh, you know, let's put it into this dog food from next to a mink farm that he also owns. Oh, wow, that's interesting. Okay, well, let's talk about the court trial because you have just sort of completed that and you're waiting for a sentencing, I think. Can we start from the beginning? Like, <laughs> at what point did the cop show up at your door and say, you know, you're under arrest or how, how did this happen? Um, well, so I, I completed the investigation. I basically uh, worked with animal justice compiling um, like a formal complaint that listed every instance of uh, you know violation of the, the National Farm Animal Care Council's code for raising mink, uh, violations of the OSPCA Act, you know, the criminal violations, basically crimes. And um, we gave that report to the OSPCA um, about a month later, I got a call from the OSPCA. They actually came down to Waterloo, where I was living at the time, and did an interview with me inside the police station, which was uh, kind of nerve-wracking. And then about a month after that, I got my first call from a detective in Oshawa, uh, where I investigated a mink farm there. So I actually got to go back to the Waterloo police station. They actually interrogated me for an entire hour. Um, I got to tell people, you know, interrogations are definitely not that fun. Criminal interrogations, basically a cop just asking you questions for, you know, hours. Sometimes um, the, the half of the investig or half the interview is fine. And then uh, when I just kept replying, no comment over and over to all his questions, because I don't want to help him investigate me and let me answer his questions. Um, he just started berating me, uh, you know, calling me a loser, calling me, different names, accusing me of betraying uh, the animal rights movement, all sorts of crap, anything you could do to demean me. Um, these are typical little tactics that detectives use you know, to break down uh, interviewees to get information out of them. But uh, And were you, were you prepared for that? Like, did you know what to expect going into it? Um, well, I'd been interviewed by police before for other things. And um, I, <laughs> I actually sat down and watched hours and hours of uh, police interrogations to learn their tricks beforehand. So I didn't prepare myself. Also, you know, I talk with the lawyer, so basically just say no comment, uh, that's fine. And then um, I was uh, handed also arrest papers. Oh, I'm trying to think of the second time. Um, yeah, I got a call from another detective asking me to come to Collingwood about uh, a few months after that. Um, I was also arrested with a uh, break and enter. And then um, the third time I was actually on the way back from a hearing in Collingwood I had actually just won that case. They had uh, downgraded my charge to trespass. I was on the way home and I got a phone call from Kingston saying I'm to be arrested again for another charge. So it was quite tedious. Uh, in addition, you know, I was civilly sued for you know uh, tens of thousands of dollars by one of the fur farmers I beat in court. So uh, you know, it was kind of nerve wracking. A little bit of had a little bit of stress because I went, I went know at the time this was all happening when I, you know, somebody called me, I would worry if it's a detective or the police or whatever, got to worry about police showing up to my house. Uh, at the time this was happening, an activist friend of mine, um, Jenny McQueen had her house raided by the police. So they actually, you know, uh, you know, went into her house, uh, you know, confiscated her computer, a bunch of equipment, cell phones, this kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, I was thinking the whole time, this is going to happen to me, the cops are going to come to my house. Uh, because of a similar situation. She had went into a farm and rescued a pig. Uh, I'm under investigation for these break and enters, you know, even though I didn't really, I didn't take any animals, I didn't break anything, I didn't damage any property. I basically just walked around and filmed. But, uh, you know, they treat this uh, like I'm some kind of arch criminal. Uh, the media has even called me a terrorist, uh, you know, in the past. So, well, congrat walking, congratulations. walking around with a flashlight. It's crazy. Right. 
Wow. Yeah. Congratulations. I mean, it takes a lot to get that designation, I think. And, and, and meanwhile, what was the OSPCA uh, being, what, what, how are they being treated for, I mean, what were they doing? Um, well, the OSPCA had a long history of, you know, ignoring complaints uh, about these fur farms. I had emailed them a few times. I know other activists that have, uh, you know, emailed them, sent them photographs of stuff that's happening. Um, we protested at the location of some of these farms. Um, one location where you know the animals had a lot of injuries and stuff, the police actually went inside these sheds to see if activists had run in there. But uh, I guess they didn't check on the condition of the animals because they didn't do anything, uh, which is one of the reasons why you know I initiated this investigation because I know the OSPCA had been ignoring complaints, um, at least publicly, not responding to them. And um, it's very unfortunate because they didn't end up doing anything about. Uh, you know what's happening to these animals and uh, we'll never know why because you can't uh, you can't do a Freedom of Information Act request on them they're a private entity um, also it was very bad timing in my case because I had wanted them to help these animals but they uh, they lost their designation to help farm animals about a year after this happened um, they went to court and uh, basically they're just a organization for cats and dogs now uh, anything to do with farm animals has been transferred to a new police division here called PAWS, which is supposed to you know, help farmed animals. They probably don't, I don't really know. They're, they're brand new, they're not really tested out yet. So we'll see if uh, you know, this organization's a bit better, probably not. So it's under the police? It's, it, it's, it's not, like, is there any government ministry or any government employees whose job it is to go and monitor what's going on in these fur farms? Um, no, at the time, no, I'm not sure about now. I don't think so. But um, I had actually contacted the Minister of Agriculture a couple of times. They informed me that no inspections of any fur farm uh, in Ontario by any government agency had been completed within like, I think, eight years. Um, so these farmers are basically left to do whatever they want to these animals with no fear of inspections, uh, no repercussions. Uh, any inspections that may have been done would have been announced beforehand and given the farmer plenty of time to you know, clean up their act. Right. Um, again, at my trial, Walt Freeman, the fur farmer that is uh, trying to get me thrown in jail, actually had to admit to um, lying to the court because he thought that he was following the guidelines. He testified that he was, and then the next day uh, at trial, he had to email in after being, uh, you know, uh, told by his fur farm buddies that he actually had been in violation of the codes. But he did, he did, the guy that's supposed to be, you know, a uh, leader in the industry doesn't even know what he's supposed to be doing with these animals. Right, because no, and nobody's reminding him of what he's supposed to be doing and why are we doing this in the first place? It's totally unnecessary. Okay, so you're being uh, chased around by police and you're having to go from various different cities in Ontario and you're concerned that your home is going to get raided. Um, and then at what point did, did you, do you end up in the court? Like, how do we get from there to the courtroom? Um, well, it was, it was a lengthy process. I was charged by three of these farms with break and enter. Um, you know, the first one, um, was in Oshawa. We had some rallies there. Um, they actually ended up, um, withdrawing the charge. So there was no charge. And then, uh, I was charged, uh, with a break and enter in Collingwood, um, they downgraded the charge to convicting me with a trespass, uh, which usually if you're convicted of the trespass, you know, holds no criminal record. Um, there's a fine associated with it. It could be 65 to, I think, $10,000. Um, I, I was given no fine. I was put on probation, but it was not reporting, so I didn't actually have to do anything. It was just words and um, no punishment. But they, they downgraded this charge in Collingwood on condition that Kingston would prosecute me. So the two prosecutors in these two different cities colluded um, to make sure that I was prosecuted in at least one of these jurisdictions. So it is um, a lot of coordination by government, by the fur industry, by the police to um, you know, come after me, uh, you know, punitively um, punish me for these actions, to send a message to others not to do this type of behavior, to do these uh, public inquiries or probes and, um, you know, send a message. And and where is is the ag gag legislation at this point? Is has it been enacted yet? Um, well, I'm not. I don't want to say for sure, but from what my own knowledge, um, it was enacted in June 2020. Right. Um, and I think 
I think they were able to arrest people. I know somebody that was charged um, under the bill this month or last month um, for, um, I don't know if they were giving water to a pig on the transport. They were with the save movement, stopping uh, the slaughter trucks, right? Somebody yeah. got charged under the bill. Uh, I know another activist that had gone onto fur farms uh, to videotape the conditions and show the public. Uh, this is probably, you know, like six months ago, they're charged under the act now. So, um, so all this, people. all this stuff that's happening to you is happening is not even under the ag gag legislation. No, this, uh, ag gag legislation, um, actually passed in part, um, due to my actions with this investigation. Um, I'm not the sole reason for this legislation because of the, uh, you know, it's already president of the United States and that had been passed in Alberta, but, um, there were actually cities and mayors having, you know, city uh, council meetings um, with the Minister of Agriculture um, to see what to do about these investigations and these rescues. They actually named me and Jenny McQueen as, uh, you know, the instigators of these things. There were some news articles about it. Um, you know, it's uh, it just shows how 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 awful the government is when they, go, they, they pass this kind of legislation to hide uh, basically animal cruelty from the public. This the sole design of these, uh, these types of legislation. Um, they're passed under this guise of protecting farmers from trespassers, this kind of stuff. But uh, you know, I didn't even do anything to these farmers and even wreck their property or take their animals or anything. So there really is no threat. Um, then, one of the other main talking points that they use to pass these ag gag bills is biosecurity. Um, there's actually a member of uh, federal parliament, um, he's a conservative, I can't remember the guy's name, but he wanted to pass this ag gag bill across uh, all of Canada, it's a private member's bill, and um, he actually used in his reasoning, you know, all these outbreaks, which I mentioned earlier, mad cow disease, avian flu, swine flu, all this as uh, reasons why they need this uh, legislation, but none of these outbreaks had ever occurred from an investigator or from an activist. These just occur naturally and it makes you question, um, you know, the root of the problem. Is the root of the problem activists exposing animal cruelty on these farms or is the root of the problem these farms creating these zoonotic diseases without activists even going on them? There is no, there is no question that activists aren't spreading diseases. We use security or uh, biosecure protocols. We wear, you know, these uh, protective clothing, protective gloves. Uh, we sanitize our equipment and ourselves to make sure that we don't spread these diseases. But again and again, uh, you know, politicians and the media reiterate this talking point, even though it's, uh, it's completely false. Right. Yeah, I spoke with Jeffrey Gear um, last year, and he was uh, speaking about when he was actually working undercover on farms and how in terms of biosecurity, he said there's workers and trucks and equipment that are that go from farm to farm to farm and there's no protocol for concerning biosecurity uh, just within the farm employees. So yeah, so they present the law as though it's meant to be one thing, but really, you know, I, I don't think that, that, that like they're not going to be chasing animal activists around on, um, you know, flax farms or chickpea farms or uh, lentil farms, right? And these animals uh, are, are being treated in these ways that people ought to know about. And you guys are heroes for doing that. Absolutely. So I'm still a bit shocked that this is how you're treated prior to the ag gag legislation, and now I can one can only imagine what the ag gag legislation is going to to do. But so back to your situation. So some, somehow you end up in court. Now there's no jury going on. I don't really understand how the court system works, but it's just you and a judge and your lawyers. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, we decided to go with the judge uh, because she has to write basically a legal reason uh, why there is or isn't a conviction. Um, and that way, if it does go to an appeal court, then the appeal judges can uh, look at that decision and there's a lot more chance that they can overturn it. Uh, because if I was found guilty by a jury, uh, they basically don't have to give any reason. Um, so oh. if it goes to an appeal court, there are judges, there's nothing for them to do, uh, basically. So there are opportunities were greater this way. So that's uh, why we chose to do that. 
Um, going back to the biosecurity though, um, you know, you're saying <clears throat> there's these companies that go from farm to farm. Um, you know, in addition to that, anybody can look at the videos I shot and just see, you know, these, these uh, cages, you know, all these fur farms all over Ontario just covered in feces. Um, you know, there's feces and urine mixed in the animal's food underneath the, the uh, cages or just, you know, sludge pits like uh, sludge pits like a foot deep filled with urine and feces and maggots. Like there's no biosecurity on these farms. This is just disgusting treatment of animals. Uh, they're supposed to have fences around them. One of the farms I went to didn't even have a fence to keep wild animals out. So you got, you know, skunks or cats or whatever transmitting disease in and out of this farm all day long. Um, you know, this is ridiculous claim. Um, also, I know this ag gag legislation is important. It is a deterrent and it will hide animal cruelty. Um, but, you know, again, this um, wasn't in effect when I did it. My penalties are quite higher. The ag gag legislation, I don't think, offers uh, significant jail time. There are some fines, but, you know, I'm facing up to 10 years in jail for this. Uh, that hasn't even stopped me and it hasn't even stopped other activists. The, the, prospect of spending, you know, a huge fraction of your life in prison. We care about these animals and we want them out of there and we're willing to put ourselves at risk and the ag gag legislation is not going to stop us. Wow. Wow. Well, it is going to stop a lot of people though. I mean, it is, and that's its intention, right? Is to put uh, fear into us and, and there are, you know, brave warriors like yourself and, um, so it's, the decision now is in the hands of a judge. Um, were you able to show the judge uh, some of the footage that, that you took in these places? Yeah, we actually played the entirety of all the footage I collected at Walt Freeman's fur farm, uh, which was actually the least bad of all the fur farms. We had planned to play um, all the footage. So we did play um, some short clips of the other farms as well. Um, but um, we weren't able to, actually I wasn't allowed, okay, so what happened was I wasn't allowed to play the footage of the other farms, but I was able to detail, uh, and spoken, ver verbally detail my experience at these farms. So I basically explained to the judge what I saw, and then we showed, you know, the horrifying conditions at Walt Freeman's fur farm, and he had to go over and kind of uh, make commentary on it as well. And what was his response? Oh, well, he had all sorts of excuses. He said he only cleaned, he claimed I only went into one of his sheds. Um, there's probably like, you know, 15 or 20 sheds there uh, on his property. I went into several of them. So his claim is I only went into the worst one because he only cleans uh, each shed uh, once a month or something. They're on a rotation or some crap, but uh, wow. you know, obviously that's not true. Um, you know, he just claims I'm, I'm vegan and says I want the whole industry destroyed, obviously. Um, but, you know, many people are against fur. I think I just read like 85% of Canadians would support a ban on fur farming uh, here. So, wow. he, he, you know, he just floundered. He's, he's a farmer. He's not used to coming to court. He's not used to activism or like advocating for, you know, his cause. He's just, he's just some farmer. Um, and um, you know, I think that showed in court, he didn't really know what he was doing. I think you bit off more than you can chew. Right. And I remember Leslie also mentioning um, that, that, that these guys aren't really, if they were had to do it just on their own without government subsidies, they probably wouldn't do it. Like, because there's, there's really not a lot of money in it. There's, like, this is a heavily subsidized industry, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I've read articles about, um, especially in Nova Scotia, the, the mink farmers there. Um, taking all sorts of government handouts for the tune of, you know, millions of dollars. Um, you know, these farms are, you know, going belly up uh, every day, um, you know, because of the, these fur bans being passed in California, fur farm bans all over Europe, um, you know, Denmark uh, basically destroying the fur trade this year. Um, the North American Fur Auction in Toronto, uh, where we used to protest quite frequently, um, they lost their, their main uh, financier or credit a financier so they basically they didn't declare bankruptcy but they have no money and they owe millions of dollars to fur farmers uh, fur retailers anybody involved with the auction um, so they didn't actually hold um, the auction this year as far as I know wow okay um and okay back to the trial then so the the the, the judge has now reviewed all of the the stuff you sent and this 
this was the first internet trial, I think you said? It was, it was all live streamed? Yeah, it was the first internet trial in Canada that I'm aware of for an animal rights activist. Um, you know, this is all due to COVID. I think it actually worked out better um, because in a courtroom, you can only hold you know, so many people, but we've had hundreds of people watch the trial live all over the world online here. So more people could access it. Um, there's actually a little story behind that. So um, I think they're originally going to try to make it a Zoom uh, trial like they do for a lot of them. But uh, we contacted PETA and we contacted you know, all our networks and we had um, at least 23,000 people contact the, uh, the poor trial coordinator at the Kingston Courthouse demanding that they could watch. And they were asking for the Zoom code or to make it public. So they finally caved and decided to broadcast the entire thing on YouTube. Um, so you could watch it live. It's not recorded because it's illegal to record it, but um, so many people watched it. It was uh, you know, definitely good to get the word out and expose the horrors of these, these uh, awful fur farms to the world. Right. Yeah. And so what, what's going to happen next? You're, you're, you're waiting to find out if you're going to jail for 10 years, basically? Uh, well, hopefully I don't do any time, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the, I'll just break down the, what happened at the trial a little bit from front to back to give your, your viewers okay. kind of an idea. So we had um, scheduled an entire week of the trial back in uh, the end of December, beginning or beginning of December. Um, so basically, Walt Freeman testified for an entire day. We showed all the videos. Um, we were supposed to get an expert witness to come in, uh, a professor from Cambridge University, um, who's basically built his life's work around, uh, you know, mink welfare, mink farming, this kind of stuff. Uh, he made a huge scathing uh, witness statement, testimony, or whatever about um, fur farming in a, in a document, but the the, um, the judge disallowed it, so it got entered into oh. uh, I think evidence. Um, uh, without actually being heard at this trial, but it might be able to be used in an appeal trial. Um, the next day I testified, uh, I talked about, you know, my history as an animal rights activist, um, my citizens action plan to get, um, you know, the government uh, moving on these fur farms, you know, exposing it. Um, and then the, the trial broke for um, a couple of months and it resumed in February last week. And um, the, both lawyers just gave their closing arguments um, and then uh, now we're awaiting the verdict from the judge. Um, I was told by another activist who, who uh, sued the Toronto police. Um, he, he wanted to uh, bring a backpack with items into a park and it got confiscated by the police uh, during a protest and he wanted to protect people's rights. Anyway, he said his trial took six months to get a verdict. So I'm not, he told me not to wait. So I'm, I, I was expecting it this week, but now I'm kind of not. So I don't know when to, it's at, the, it's at the judge's discretion. So whenever that happens. Right. Well, it's kind of stressful, right? Like you, you don't really know what to expect and what, how to plan your life. I've been, I've been going through this for three years because every time, you know, it was a new charge. Um, every time I got charged, I got um, stipulations or conditions from the police. So basically at one point I wasn't allowed to leave Ontario. Um, even though I was moving to Montreal, looking to buy a house here, I wasn't allowed. We had sold our house. We, <laughs> we were expecting to move. I couldn't even go look at houses or apartments or anything out of the province. We had to do it all within like a week's time because of this. And uh, I was actually banned from going in uh, a few regions within Ontario. So there was like several cities I couldn't visit for a couple months. Um, all sorts of ridiculous stuff. My lawyer had it all struck down, but it was, uh, you know, it did take time. And uh, it was very annoying and disruptive to my life. Uh, obviously having to raise money for three years for a lawyer. Um, but, you know, I think this court case, you know, if it, um, <clears throat> if I win, it's going to send a strong message to, you know, the animal exploitation industries, to the fur industry. And um, it's, it's going to open the doors for more people to do this kind of um, work in, in, uh, in the interest of uh, the public and knowledge for the public. Um, Right, and you've certainly uh, generated a lot of media, so maybe people are rethinking about whether they want to wear other people's fur on their bodies and, and that sort of thing. So meanwhile, all of this is happening to you. What, what's happening at the farm? It's just business as, as usual at, at these mink farms? Yeah, business as usual. They're, they're still continuing to do what they do. I heard one of the farms I investigated closed down. I'm um, not sure if that was related to me or if uh, the claim is true. Somebody told me that, so that was good news. Um, 
yeah, basically not much happened. Um, there was actually another investigation um, going on at a mink firm alongside the time when I was doing my own. Um, there's a group called Last Chance for Animals. I think they're based out of California. Um, they had an undercover employee at one of the largest fur firms in Ontario, uh, near Guelph. Uh, it's called the Millbank Fur Firm. They you know, documented even more disgusting stuff than I saw because you know they had an operative there for months. Right. So they could pick out you know each the worst of the animals there, and that fur farmer is facing several charges. Um, so you know this just uh, just proves my point, and it's additional evidence to my case that this uh, fur farming industry needs to be banned uh, in Canada and around the world. Yeah, it's ridiculous. And, you know, I'm, I think there should be some kind of civil lawsuit against all these, all these industries that are creating COVID and all these other diseases and the variants and who knows what's next, right? Like, it's, uh, it's totally unnecessary. Um, and we can do, you know, we can boycott as consumers, we can all be vegan, that's kind of the least thing we can do and support folks like you, but ultimately big changes have to happen. Okay, so there's a few things happening then. Um, a real fur film documentary is coming out and I think you're featured in that, right? Yep. Is your footage yep. going to be shown in that, some of it? Yeah, I got to watch uh, a preview of the movie already. Um, I can't go into too much detail because it's not released yet. It was, uh, it was supposed to be released last November, but the, the COVID and the shutdowns, um, yeah, they're going to show my footage. Um, they have uh, interviews, I think, with uh, Camille Labchuk from Animal Justice, um, interviews with um, a representative of Fur Bear Defenders. Um, they actually have uh, an ex-employee of a mink firm um, who talks against, uh, you know, the industry and he explains what he saw in his fur firm and, you know, the horrifying ways in which animals are treated there. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this documentary, you know, getting out into the world so that people can see it. Uh, I really have a good feeling that this is going to do um, for Mink what uh, Blackfish did for whales. Uh, you know, people saw the movie Blackfish, you know, you saw, you know, places like SeaWorld, Marineland, you know, starting to uh, you know, take more and more heat from the public, less and less people attend these places or support animal captivity, um, you know, you can't keep whales or dolphins in captivity anymore in Canada. It's illegal in part because of this film. And I think if, you know, Canadians and, you know, other people see this uh, footage and they hear these stories, um, you know, like, you know, animals with their ears rotting off, their tails chewed off. And, you know, they hear about this and, and the trapping too, which is just as bad, you know, animals paws get ripped off in these traps. They freeze to death. When people see this, they're not going to buy fur anymore. I think some people aren't aware, but uh, this just hammers it home that much more. And if it becomes, um, you know, widely available to people, I think it's gonna it's gonna really kill the industry even more. That's great. Well, I'll keep an eye out for it. Okay, real fur. All right. So, what can we do to support you? Uh, and uh, do you have a GoFundMe? And are, is there's a petition, I think. And and what else can we do to help you? Uh, yeah, so there's the GoFundMe. It's just hashtag mink trial GoFundMe. You can find it. Um, watch the film Real Fur when it comes out. You know, show your friends and family. Um, there is a petition out right now by um, a liberal MP um, to get fur farming banned, uh, mink farming specifically due to the COVID. So I recommend people go there and you know sign it. Um, there's not much else people can do to support me at this point. I've already went through the trial. Um, you know, if I go to jail, send me some letters, though. Send me a, a cake with a, a vegan cake with a file in it, maybe. Right, right, right. Yeah. Where if you go to jail, where where would it be? Do you know? Have you ever uh, been to jail? No, I've not been yeah. to jail. Yeah. Prison, no. um, probably somewhere in Ontario, I'm guessing. I really have no idea. Right. Well, let's hope that doesn't happen. I mean, that I, you know, I just can't imagine that, that, that you're exposing the cruelty and you're the one <laughs> It's craziness. It's just craziness. Um, and as a social justice activist, you mentioned that you were active for environmental causes and poverty and stuff. And I also have uh, traveled in those circles. And so for, for the people there who haven't yet connected to the animal uh, piece, um, you know, and maybe they don't, they're just not going to get it. But I think that ag gag legislation and this whole censorship um, theme that's coming down on, on activists, you know, we, 
do you want to speak, what would you say to them about the ag gag legislation? Like, why should they care about it, even if they don't care about animals? Well, um, everybody should be concerned with this ag gag legislation because it, um, it targets not only just, uh, you know, hiding animal cruelty. I've read uh, instances in the states where this legislation is worded in such a way that it made it illegal for people to report on elderly abuse at nursing homes or, or child abuse, at like a daycare, um, because you're not allowed to videotape or record um, things that are happening. Um, basically, anywhere an animal is kept now in Ontario, um, you know, farm animal or zoo animal is uh, considered an animal protection zone, uh, like a slaughterhouse, slaughter truck, these farms. So um, basically, it stops uh, groups like Mercy for Animals, who would get an undercover employee uh, in, the, in the plant or wherever, these facilities to record um, and expose these horrific things that are happening to animals. Uh, everybody wants animals to be treated well, even people that use them, nobody wants, you know, egregious cruelty to happen to them. So that's over now. There's no more investigations like that. Um, people can't go up and stop these slaughter trucks. It basically hides anything happening to animals. Um, you can imagine too, if there was like something like sexual harassment or uh, um, sexual assault happening at a slaughterhouse, if somebody recorded it, it would be brought into question whether this recording could be used under Ag Gag Bill 156. Um, so other people should be definitely concerned that the government is uh, censoring what's happening, stopping journalists, stopping investigators. This concerns us all. Yeah, thanks. Okay, well, thank you so much for taking the time. Is there anything else, Malcolm, that you want to say before we go? Um, yeah, go vegan. <laughs> Best decision ever, right? Yeah, for sure. It'll change your life. Absolutely. Okay, thank you so much for everything that you're doing and uh, cross fingers that it's all going to work out on for the animals, all of us animals, right? For sure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Malcolm.